of the Lord. It's a good feel in the house today. I feel the joy. I feel expectation. Worship was awesome. The presence of the Lord is so strong this morning. And I love having a place that we call home where the presence of the Lord is always so welcome. God is so gracious. Amen. Tyler, this morning's message is, it's the best of times and the worst of times. I consulted with some family this morning, and I was told that I need to retitle, it's the end of the world as we know it. (laughs) So if he breaks out in song, (laughs) it's the end of the world. Anyway, I'm singing the DC Talk version, in case you're wondering. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we asked Miss Annie to sing that, and she was not familiar with it, so. <laughs> I don't know where, where she was in the 80s, but it was there. <laughs> so it's the best of times and the worst of times. At the end of 2023, we were doing a podcast, and um, I was asked what I felt about the season, closing out 2023 and beginning 2024, and I said, I feel like we're, in my spirit and what I felt that, that God has, has shown me was that we were going to see some of the best of things and some of the worst of things. And I said, it's like the best of times and the worst of times. And then I was informed that that was a Charles Dickens uh, quote from the Tale of Two Cities. So every time I've said this, and God has really brought this back up, uh, I have readdressed the fact that Charles Dickens was the original quoter of that statement. I didn't know he was that, I mean... I said it and then found out he's, anyway. So I have not taken the time until recently to actually look up what old Charlie said. So this is what Charles Dickens wrote in the Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief. It was the epic of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope and the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. In short, the period was so far like the present period that some of the noisiest authorities insisted on its being received for good or evil in the superlative degree of comparison only. Now that's Charles Dickens' quote from the Tale of Two Cities, and I'm reading that. That was in 1859. 165 years ago. And I'm reading that, and now I know this is a uh, fictional work, but I'm reading that, and I'm thinking how prophetic 
Charles Dickens was in 1859 describing the day that we see before us. It was a day of great wisdom. We have more knowledge, more wisdom, more information than any other generation ever. A hundred years ago, they said nothing else can be invented. We've invented everything that can be invented. Aren't you glad somebody didn't stop? Mark said cell phone. I'm thinking air conditioner. <laughs> indoor plumbing. They said nothing else could be invented before indoor plumbing. Thank the Lord they did not stop. Now we have indoor plumbing that you don't even have to touch. You just you look at it and it comes on. I went to the restroom in a, in a uh, department store recently and, you know, I go to wash my hands and I walk up to it and the water didn't come on and I was trying to figure out what was wrong with it. <laughs> now, some of you are thinking, uh huh, it had a handle. No, it really didn't. It was broke. But I was like... <laughs> nothing was happening. I was like... How am I going to wash my hands? I mean, this was a conflict. Little boy was in there too. He was running from each one, trying to find one to work. That's an inconvenience. Who would have thought we had the technology that we have now? We're so smart, but yet we're dealing with some of the most foolish of things. It's a time of great belief, but yet great unbelief. You don't know what to believe. Savannah called me the other day and told me she had drove by a tragic event that took place locally. And she's describing to me what she saw. So I'm trying to pull it up on the news. What the news had to say is not what she had to say. So then other people that were actually there and saw the crime take place, they gave their report, which was completely different than what the news did. The news has their own agenda. I'm assuming to keep certain types of crime numbers down in, in statistics, that would be my guess because the news got information from the police, so forth, so on. What we see reported to us is turned and, and tainted. We don't know what's absolutely true. So we're dealing in a time of great wisdom and great belief, but yet great unbelief and great foolishness. We're living in times of great darkness, but yet great light. So it is the best of times and the worst of times. And if you notice, my graphic is the eclipse. I know some of you are waiting on a prophetic word about the eclipse. You can go online and find all of them you want. I'm not going to give you a prophetic word about the eclipse, but I will tell you what the eclipse means to me, I actually did the graphic not because I was going to mention on the eclipse. I did the graphic because I thought it was very um, uh, symbolic of the message today. So I will tell you where I fit. Let me, let me just give my, my personal stance on this because I, I'll make a public statement on me personally. There are those prophesying over here that tomorrow is going to be the rapture. That means... That I can preach whatever I want to preach today and I don't have to worry about you getting mad because it will only last for 23 hours. <laughs> then you have those on the other side of the spectrum that don't even know the eclipse is happening. <laughs> so let me give you what I feel. We're going to discuss Joel chapter 2 by the end of the message, but let me give you this. In Joel chapter 2, it says that there will be signs in the heavens. That word signs, it is omens, indicators, it is messages. So God speaks to us in the, in the signs of natural events. Sometimes it is signs of hope. Sometimes it is signs of warning. This eclipse, I feel, is both. So, I, I've, I've not prayed for a prophetic word about the eclipse, 
because I don't care about jumping on the bandwagon. Anybody that is anybody that's a prophet right now, they've been working really hard to come up with a prophetic word. And quite frankly, my head can only handle so much. So let me just give you what I'm feeling in my spirit. You cannot overlook the fact that seven years ago we had an eclipse that passed over cities called Salem. You cannot overlook the fact that this eclipse is passing over seven cities called Nineveh. You cannot overlook the fact that this eclipse that is coming right through America, that eight days before the eclipse happens, the President of the United States stands up from his position of authority and makes an official declaration from the White House that is an antichrist declaration against Christianity on the most holy day of Christianity. And then denies anyone to have any scriptural Christian based egg in the Easter egg hunt at the White House. Eight days prior to an eclipse. Three days prior to the eclipse, we have an earthquake in Lebanon, New Jersey. Lebanon means cleansing or purification. Then we have an eclipse And don't look at the eclipse tomorrow. Even though it will be dark, you can still hurt your eyes. 41 days after the eclipse, it's Pentecost. So you cannot overlook the facts that are present in these events. Now let me give you what I feel this is. This is what the Lord has, or what I have felt on my heart since the beginning of, of all the uproar about it. I don't think that tomorrow is the rapture. I'll call you about 2 o'clock to make sure. We, we, we're all going to have a string tied to Mimi. I can tell you what, though, if the eclipse calls communications to go down and then, and then me and Mark start crying to call mom and all we get is beep, 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 beep. <laughs> we all going to be out here. <laughs> this is my opinion. God sent a prophet to Nineveh twice. He sent Jonah. And he said, Nahum. In Jonah's day, there was an eclipse and there was an earthquake. And he came in and the message was received. And for 40 days, they had 40 days to repent. And then on the 41st, God brought revival. Economically, socially, spiritually. I don't believe that this... I, I, I believe that this, this eclipse is a sign to the church... To press in, and it is a sign to the world. Wake up and listen. But I believe this is a sign for the church. I'm bringing fresh revival. If I can sum it down into one statement, that's what I would give you. I'm bringing fresh revival. So that's what I feel about the eclipse. Let me get into the message. And, and I can clarify a little bit more about fresh revival. Let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. Because this is going to be a hopeful message. A good times message. And a bad times message. <laughs> In 2 Timothy chapter 3, we, we have Paul that is... In, in First and Second Timothy, Paul is instructing Timothy. So these are these two epistles are Paul's letters to Timothy, his spiritual son that will carry on his ministry and legacy. So First Timothy, he goes through all these instructions, and Second Timothy, he goes through these instructions, and then by the time he gets to the end, he he really wants to get the awareness to Timothy of what is coming, and he says. There will be 
Uh, he says, understand this. In the last days, I'm reading now the ESV. There will come times of difficulty. The King James says, perilous times. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to the parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. For, for among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women burdened with sin and led astray by various passions, always learning but never able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth. Just as Jannes and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith, but they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was those to men. So when it says perilous times, that word perilous is kalepos, and it is only used two times in Scripture. It is used right here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and it is used in Matthew chapter 8 to describe the behavior of the demoniac. So this wasn't just, oh, there's going to be difficult times. The word difficult is used a lot. We all have difficult times. Amen? Life is full of difficulties. You go to the store at the wrong time, and it can be a difficult time. Go to the gas pump at any time, and it's a difficult time. So, so we understand difficult times, but kalapos is different. This is demonic times. It means fierce. It means demonic. It means furious. It means the idea of reducing the strength. It is times that are so difficult that it causes you to feel weak just because of the time that you're in. That's interesting. When you look at something and, and just the thought of it begins to be so overwhelming that it causes you to feel weak. Have you ever had a phone call that just took the strength out of you? Like that. He says, son, in the end times, he said, I, I need you to understand. Paul tells us over and over in scripture. He said, I don't want you to be caught unaware. So he tells Timothy, he says, son, there's going to come in the last days. What are the last days? It is the final stage. He said, in these last days, there are going to come times that are so demonic. You're going to see this because people are going to be so consumed with themselves. They're going to be hateful. They're not going to care about anyone else. They're going to be so uh, filled with greed and conceit and pride that they're going to be so narcissistic in their behavior, so self-consumed that they won't care about anyone else. They're going to be driven by this demonic behavior. So don't be caught off guard. Oh, and by the way, there's going to be some like Jannies and Jambres. Well, these were the two magicians that opposed Moses. Moses throws his staff on the ground, and it becomes a snake. They throw a staff on the ground. Out comes a snake. So then Moses is snake. Slithers on over, has a snacky snack. They do, they try to perform the same signs that Moses did by acts of witchcraft and trickery. And Moses exposed them over and over and over in their attempts. So Paul says, just as Jannes and Jambres tried to oppose Moses, there are those rising up and they will have false signs. They will have false wonders. They will have false words. But don't worry because God's exposing them. It will be made clear just as it was with Jannes and Jambres. We are living in the time that we will see great darkness. So I want to give you points about this season. Number one are, are, is demonic times. If you watch any news or if you go to Facebook for your news, you can see we're living in demonic times. 
ministers being exposed for doing things that are absolutely unimaginable. Politicians and, and, and Hollywood elite people that have been worshipped as idols being exposed for heinous crimes. We're living in demonic times. So Paul, he's making it very clear not to be afraid, but the understanding that these, when you see these things, it's not something to fear. It's something to understand that this is a sign of the last days. Now, there was a prophetic timeline, right? So so everything that's happened, God already knew it was going to happen. He knows the end from the beginning. Nothing that happens to us personally, to us nationally, to us globally, nothing that happens catches God off guard. It's not like he, he sits back, I didn't see that coming. He already knew before the foundation of the world well, how this was going to play out. That's why Jesus was slain before the foundation of the world because he knew he would give man the law. He knew man would sin and that they would have be in need of the law. He would give them the law, but the law would be uh, dependent on the work of the person. And he knew that there had to be that span of time that man could see that you could not be holy in and of yourself by works. And he would bring the propitiation for sin, the Messiah, the only one worthy, the spotless lamb, the only one worthy to be the sacrifice for the sins of humanity. God already knew all this. He already knew that you and I would be sitting in this room today. Think about that. When he breathed into Adam, he knew that we would be sitting here today. Mind-blowing. So God's not caught off guard by anything, but there was this prophetic timeline. And and when, when Christ broke the darkness, when the birth of Jesus Christ, it, it split time. So from that point forward, there was a prophetic timeline. It was a countdown for the calling away of God's people, the judgment of God on the world, his reign, and our eternity. So that timeline began, and so... When we hear the term last days, it's referring to the final play out of that time. Now, we don't know how long the last days are. I mean, technically, the last days began in the New Testament with the early church. But the more you get to the end of that, the more intense all those things get, like birth pains, is what Jesus says in Matthew 24. So, we don't know. When that day comes, Jesus said, I don't know. Only the Father knows. So when you hear people predicting the year that of the rapture, surely y'all are more mature than that. If you hear people predicting a, a date of any sort for the return of Christ, just don't believe them. And don't call me and ask me. Because I love you and I don't want to hurt your feelings. Because if you call me and ask me, well, I heard so-and-so said that, the, that Jesus is re- going to return on July 4th. I'm like, really? You've been in this church this long? Have I done that poor of a job? Jesus said, I don't know the day nor the hour. Only the Father knows. But we do know the signs of the times that say, oh, the birth pains are getting closer. I'll tell you a story. Because y'all love my stories. When Sean was pregnant with Savannah, we had to go back, right? We lived approximately, what, four miles from the hospital. I mean, by the time labor started, we could have walked and got there in time. But she's tough. She can walk. So so we sit down. We're we're having dinner one night. And she went. A few minutes later, she does it again. So I'm like, I didn't want to freak her out. So, Well, she starts grabbing her stomach every eight minutes. Well, 
I slip out and I call the doctor. I said, hey, Shauna's, Shauna's in labor. She, she's having contractions every eight minutes. He says, well, go ahead and get your stuff. Come on down to the hospital. I'll be in there a little while to check on her. This was at uh, 9 o'clock at night. When he said I'll be in there in a little while, he meant 8 o'clock the next morning. <laughs> His little bit and my little bit were not the same. So I loaded her up. I got her. I, I, I was trying to get her to the car. We had a little, little truck. We were coming down Forsyth. I was doing like 75 down Forsyth. Flashers on. I'm thinking this baby could come any second. <laughs> Almost. It was about, what, 12 hours or so that you were in labor? We get to the hospital and this nurse, this nurse coming there, she said, well, we need to see if you're actually in labor. I looked at her. <laughs> like, how dare you? If I tell you that woman's in labor, she in labor. And she was. The nurse said, oh, you're in labor. I was like, no, really? Glad you got that education there. You could have listened to me and saved you a lot of money. Anyway. We would count when those contractions would get closer and closer and closer. Those doctors or that doctor and those nurses, they do this every day. They know when it's a false start. I didn't. I was like, she don't fake. <laughs> Man, that would have been a long ride. Are you faking? You, are you even pregnant? <laughs> I'm coming over this side. <laughs> so... Those doctors and those nurses, they know. They know the frequency of those birth pains. They know the signs. They know when the, the process of dilation. They, they know when these things are happening. They know when there's a problem. Or should know when there's a problem. Right? So spiritually, we should be the same way. We should be able to see, no, 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 this is not the birth pains of the end times. This is just the fact that you forgot to gas up your car. This one's on you. But then we should look at the way things are happening and go, wait, it's not just America. It's around the globe right now. There's so much demonic activity. Why is it that our leaders are making every decision possible to destroy our nation, not to build our nation? Why, why, why are we kicking our veterans to the streets so we can house people that come illegally? We're all immigrants. We, we know this, right? You can make that argument all you want. But to come here legally versus illegally is two different things. To use the open borders in a way to bring terrorists into our nation. If you can't kill us from without, kill us from within. I mean, is this the new government policy? We have foreign nations that fly spy balloons over our nation, and our leaders sit back and go, huh, he's so shiny. That's what you got? Shoot it down. And then finally, with enough pressure, after it makes it all the way across America, then they say, oh, well, let's shoot it down. Really? Really? Why don't, why don't you just send China the blueprints? Might as well. When we live in a day that to be a, a Christian is frowned upon in a Christian nation, something's wrong. When we live in a day that you can say just about whatever you want about just about anything, but if you get up with, with Christian values, then all of a sudden you're banned. When you get up and you give truth, but it doesn't line up to the narrative and you get blackballed. Something's not right. So when you look and you see around the world these things happening and then in the freest nation in the world, our freedoms are literally being pulled away day by day by day. You've got to stop and say there's something bigger. 
It's the birth pains. And then the prophetic word begins to come forth and come forth. And then all of a sudden, God says, I'm going to turn the sun black. Maybe that'll get your attention. We've got to be aware of the time and the season we live in. Not afraid. Aware. So we're living in the time of great demonic times. Point number two, delusion. Look at 2 Thessalonians. And y'all wondering when I'm going to get to the best of times. You know who you need to vote for in this next election? See some of y'all, you're like, oh yeah, you're going to get kicked off YouTube now. Jesus. We need Jesus. Joe Biden is not going to save this nation. You can quote me on that. (laughs) Donald Trump is not going to save this nation. Jesus Christ, the power of his spirit, the power of the cross, the power of the blood, that's what can save America. The very thing that's been turned on is the very thing that can save our nation. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it says, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, And our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed either by spirit or spoken word or by letter seeming to come from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed and the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Uh, Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of the lawlessness one is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth. And bring him to nothing, the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by activity of Satan, with all power and false signs and wonders, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, because they refuse to love the truth, and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion, so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. That word... Delusion. Is somewhere in my notes. It is. Actually, I remember that. (laughs) It meant delusion. (laughs) In verse 11, he says that God sent the delusion over the people. I don't want you to be misunderstanding of the season we're in. Verse 11 says, God sent a strong delusion over the people so they could not believe truth. So God sends that delusion. We are not in the time of that delusion. That's something God does after the Antichrist is revealed. I don't plan on being here. When the Antichrist is revealed. First he says. Concerning these things. Concerning the coming of our Lord. I don't want you to be caught unaware. He says so. I don't want you to be shaken. I don't want you. To be. Toppled. Tossed to and fro. By the waves. I don't want you. To waver. Or to be destroyed. I don't want you to be shaken in mind or alarmed by what is written to you, what is spoken to you, or given to you in spirit. 
Those are the three things he says. So if somebody writes it and says this is what's happening, but it's in contradiction to the word, it's false. If someone says it to you, but it's in contradiction to the word, it's false. If someone says it by spirit, meaning prophecy, he says if someone prophesies it and it does not line up with the word of God, it's false. So don't be alarmed or caught off guard by someone who prophesies, someone who speaks it, or someone who writes it. If it's in contradiction to what we've given you in the word of God, it's false. I think, I believe God is, is purifying the prophetic move. We need prophecy. Amen. I love, I love the prophetic. We need that prophetic direction. It was the sons of Issachar that knew the times and the seasons and what they ought to do. We need that. We need the awareness of what is coming. We need the awareness of what is. Priceless. But we need the true prophetic. We don't need those that are trying to make a profit off being a prophet. We don't need somebody who's just trying to get, get the followings and the views and so forth in order to, uh, uh, to build their own ministry. So every time there's something that happens, they jump on the bandwagon and give a prophecy because it's what people like to follow. We need people that come out of the secret place. And they say, thus saith the Lord. I may not have spoken a word in the last 12 months, but I've been in this secret place and God's had me away in hiding and I'm coming out of the darkness to tell you, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And I'll also say this about doomsday, doomsday prophecies. Go through scripture and look. There are doomsday prophecies in there. It is the end of the world as you know it. But there's always the promise of redemption and hope. When you hear a doomsday prophecy and there's no redemption and there's no hope, run and don't buy what they're selling. I'm not trying to get on a soapbox with it, but I just, I value the prophetic so much. Man, when God speaks, He gives us that word of hope and healing in a moment. He gives us word of direction in the moment. And when somebody tries to trivialize that into being nothing more than, than a pay for profit, that, that is a very appalling to what the prophetic really is. I believe God is cleansing that prophetic move, and we're going to hear prophets being more accurate than we've ever heard and understand there's a difference in between operating prophetically and being a prophet we should all operate prophetically but then there are those that have the office the mantle of a prophet and when they stand in that office and that mantle shut up and listen so he says don't be shaken in mind or alarmed because first there has to be a falling away. So before the Antichrist is revealed, there's going to be a great, depending on the translation you have, uh, it's apostasy, falling away, or, or rebellion. There's going to first be a great falling away prior to the Antichrist being revealed. That word falling away is apost apostasia, and it means a defection from truth or a divorce from truth. He says, so don't be, don't be confused about the times. When you see a time come that there will be perilous times, demonic times, and you see that there is a divorce from truth, a defection from what is true. Do I need to say anything on that? Turn on the news. And then figure out what, decipher where the truth is. 
So when there's a defection from truth, when there's a generation that defects or divorces truth, now you know the scene is being prepared for the revealing of the Antichrist. But the Antichrist cannot be revealed unless the one who restrains him is no longer restraining him. Who's the restrainer? It's the Holy Spirit. Know ye not, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. That means that I have the Holy Spirit inside of me. You have the Holy Spirit inside of you. That Holy Spirit is the restraining force that is keeping the Antichrist spirit from being able to be revealed. So the work of the Antichrist or the lawless one, that work of, the, of that spirit it's already in operation. But the Antichrist itself cannot be revealed as long as the Holy Spirit is present to keep him from being revealed. You do your interpretation because I don't want to offend any post-trippers. Man, you see two, two ministers that are... They love each other. They meet each other. They just think that each other is the greatest thing until they get to the tribulation. And they're like, well, I'm, I'm pre-trib. And then the other one's mid-trib or post-trib. And all of a sudden, BFFs are, are gone. They won't speak to each other. Or if you really want to cause a fight, let, let them be from two different denominations. The work of the Antichrist is there. But the Antichrist can't be revealed until the restrainer is removed. The restrainer will not be removed until believers are out of here. That means that the calling away that Paul talks about in 2 Thessalonians, I know people fight over the dumbest things. You talk about the rapture, people are like, well, that word is not in Scripture. Well, neither is your name, so big deal. The word rapture technically is not. The principle is there. It's called a calling away or a gathering. Call it whatever you want, potato, potato. The principle is there. Those that have the Holy Spirit, those that have been washed in the blood, those that have confessed Jesus Christ as their Lord, they're going to be and not be. You don't want to call it rapture, don't call it rapture. Call it the not be. There's going to be a calling away. When the calling away happens, the, the, all those that are marked by Jesus Christ will be called away out of this place. And then the restrainer, Holy Spirit, is no longer restraining the Antichrist. And then the Antichrist comes on the scene and God places such a strong delusion that the people wouldn't know what is truth or not. Until then, the enemy tries to bring a delusion. But only, the only way to defeat the delusion is by the revelation of Jesus Christ. He's the one. First Corinthians says that they look at, at Scripture and they can read the stories, but they can't understand it because there's a veil that separates their understanding. Only by the Holy Spirit can the veil be removed and their understanding opened. You can talk to someone until you're blue in the face and never get anywhere. But the moment God touches them, you won't have to say much. So point number one is demonic times. Point number two is delusion. Point number three, great light. Great light. I'm going to go to Isaiah 60 and John chapter 1. You don't want to turn there, I'm going to read it to you, but it's Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 through 5. It says, Arise and shine, for the light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And the nation shall come to your light, and the king's to the brightness of your rising, lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your son shall come from afar. Your daughter shall be carried on the hip. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and exult because the abundance of the sea. 
shall be turned to you and the wealth of the nations will come to you. So Isaiah chapter 60 says that darkness will cover the earth and gross darkness, intense delusion will cover the people. But at the time you see darkness all over the earth, can you say we see darkness all over the earth? And gross darkness or delusion over people, when you see these signs, it is the time that God's people arise and shine for His glory comes upon His body. And then in John 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. The Word was with God. He was in the beginning. All things that were made through Him and without Him, nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness could not overcome it. So when the end times come, as we see that progression, which we are all, I mean, we've been in the end times in the last days for 2,000 years, but now we're coming to the stage of the final layout of those, those times. Darkness covers the earth, gross darkness the people. And sometimes you can, if you watch news and listen to so many things or, or spend a lot of time on on Facebook, you can get discouraged, right? You can get discouraged quick. But then when you find out that one thing's not true and then another one, then you can get really discouraged because you don't even know what to believe. You really just want somebody to tell you the truth. The answer is not in trying to figure out who's telling you the truth. The answer is in Jesus Christ, the light that shines, the darkness tries to overtake it, but it could not comprehend it. It could not overtake it. When darkness covers the earth and grows darkness the people, that is when the light shatters the darkness. We are in the last days. We are in the end times. Does that mean 24 hours? 24 years, I don't know, you don't know. But what I do know is that we are to be prepared and we are to understand the birth pangs that we feel. There's a dying generation. Maybe, maybe God didn't give us the, the complete layout because he needed us to live as if the rapture could be at any moment with the understanding that it may not be for another hundred years, that we would understand the seriousness and not let a day go by that we don't approach other people in the light. This could be our last day. Matter of fact, there's no, none of us are promised another day, right? So demonic times, delusion, great light, Borders and boundaries are being redrawn. Now this is really what I want to, a couple of points that I want to get to you right now. Genesis chapter 12. This is something that's been stirring to me for a couple of weeks. Borders and boundaries are being redrawn. Satan is coming for what is his, but Jesus is coming for what is his. In Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 9, it says, And now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that... You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and to him that dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord told him, and Lot with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran, and Abram took Sarai his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all the possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place called Shechem, to the oak of the Morah. 
And at that time, the Canaanites were in the land, and the Lord appeared to Abram, and he said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent there with Bethel to the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going toward Negev. Now here's what really amazes me is Abram was given a promise by God, but Abram never actually possessed the promise. He never saw the fulfillment of the promise. He said, to your descendants, I'll give this land, right? Now, God clarifies this, this promise with Abram later and gives it more definition. But he tells him, he says, I need you to go where I tell you to go. So he sets out and, and God would literally say, go east. So he would go east. And he would come to a place, and when he would come to that place, he would stop, and he would build an altar to the Lord and sacrifice, worship God. And then when he was through there, he would go to the next place, and he would stop, and he would build an altar, worship God, make sacrifice, and then he would go to the next. For years, he did this. Literally, Abram's path that God had him travel was literally marking the boundaries of the promise that would be given to his descendants. So everywhere, and and this is, take it to Joshua. In Joshua chapter 1, God says, everywhere your foot treads, I'll give to you. Why? That word treads the rock and it means that you're willing to fight for. That was the possession. God wasn't giving Joshua the promise. He was giving Joshua the possession. The promise was given to Abram. But it was Joshua's time to come in and possess the promise. So he says, everywhere you're willing to fight for, I'll give you. Why? Because God had already secured it over here with Abram. When Abram would go out and he would build this altar and he would mark this spot. Now this spot belongs to Abram because God told him to go there and he built an altar to God. He marked it. So then he goes to the next spot and he marks it. And he goes to the next and he marks it. So when Joshua comes, Joshua's not going by his own fruition. He's going to the places that have been marked. We've marked spots. We've marked places And we've built an altar. An altar is a place of worship. It is a place of sacrifice. I love what Mark was talking about last week with with worship. You cannot have worship without sacrifice. So think about the times you've spent in intercession. Your son, your daughter, your husband, your wife your finances, your health, your mind. Think about the times you've, you've spent in intercession. Think about the times you've worshipped, you've made sacrifice for those things. You've marked that spot. Matter of fact, if you'll think of it this way. When the plagues were coming against Egypt, the last one, Passover. They placed the blood of the lamb over the doorpost. We all know this. Think about your loved ones that you have prayed for, interceded for, and fought for. And and don't you know some days you pray so hard and you feel like you've broken through something just for them to, to treat you or act the next day ten times worse than they have in months. Right? But understand this, when you've been in those times of intercession, you've been taking that brush and you've been dipping it in the blood and you've been marking them with the blood of Jesus. So when the boundaries and the borders are being redrawn, God is looking and he sees, oh, you've marked out this territory. You've made an altar here, here, 
here, here. So the enemy has had possession in these areas. But you've been marking them with my blood, despite the enemy was still there. When they went out, when, when Abram went out, it says the Canaanites were there. So when you're praying and you're marking, the addiction's still there. The anger is still there. The rejection is still there. I'm talking about the one that you're pressing for. But you're marking them with the blood of Jesus despite what is present in the now. Because God's the one that calls things as though they are, even though they're not. So you're marking those altars and your tears and your sacrifice, your heartache is the sacrifice on the altar to the Lord. So there comes a time when Satan comes to take what is his, but Jesus comes to take what is his. So Abram goes out and he marks the territory, calling it rightfully his. In Genesis 31, you can turn there if you want. I'm not going to read through, through there. I'm going to tell you the story. Because we've been ministering out of Genesis 32 lately, right? Genesis 32 is Jacob wrestling with the angel. But what brings him to that point is he's running from Laban. So, so Jacob is running from Laban. Laban is coming to kill him. He's coming to face off with Esau that's going to kill him. But this is so amazing to me. Laban has what he feels is a right He tells Jacob in Genesis 31, he says in verse 29, it is in my power to do you harm. Laban tells Jacob, it's in my power to hurt you. Laban was not smart, okay? He says, it's in my power to hurt you, but the God of your father spoke to me last night. Now, let me interpret that for you. What Laban should have said is, I thought I had the power to harm you, but your God woke me up last night, and I realized I didn't have the power. He had the power. That's what he should have said. What he said was I have the power to harm you, but the God of your father spoke to me in a dream and told me not to speak good nor evil to you. The only thing Laban was permitted to do was to come and get what was rightfully his. God is righteous, right? It doesn't matter who's the one doing unrighteousness. God doesn't side with unrighteousness. He only sides with himself who is holy, who is righteous. It doesn't matter who the perpetrator is. So God doesn't look and go, well, you know, Jacob, son, I like you and I don't like, I don't like Laban. So, yeah, I'm going to hold Laban off and I'm going to cover what you've done here. It's not what he says. He comes to Laban. And he lets Laban know, you can go get what's yours, but don't you touch Jacob. He's mine. So Rachel, Jacob's beloved wife, had stolen idols from Jacob's house. That's what gave Jacob, uh, uh, Laban, the legal right to come. I want you to, to... To really see this, the enemy can only come and get what's his. I was praying the other day, and and I I felt so clear, Satan's coming for what's his. That can be a scary thought. Like, when you just hear that, you're praying, Satan's coming for what's his. Well, well that, that makes you kind of stop. But then if you listen, Satan's coming for what it's his. 
that means the only thing he can have is what's rightfully his, which means that I shouldn't have it in the first place. That means that God, what, what God is saying, because Jacob didn't know there was an idol there. Leah didn't tell him. You would think by now he would be like questioning everybody, hooking everybody up to a lie detector, because so far the boy's been lied to the whole time. He worked seven years for Rachel and, and, and got the other sister. That's when the bachelor started. I've never watched the episode of that, but and then he works seven more to get Rachel, and then and then he's broke. You get married, you're broke either way. I'm kidding. We were just young. <laughs> then he had to work seven more years, and he was about to get swindled out of that. Nobody in that family told him the truth. The boys should have known. It wasn't Jacob's stealing that did it. It was what was under his authority. It was something that was unaware. So when we come into the presence of the Lord, all of a sudden God begins to make aware things that we thought were gone. Unforgiveness, jealousy, envy, greed, lust, control. These, these things that we've allowed to be there, these things that we've allowed to continue, and then when they continue, they are idols. The only thing that Satan can come and still take is that which is rightfully his. Greed, rightfully his. Lust, rightfully his. Anger, unforgiveness, jealousy, envy, any of these things, they're rightfully his. So if I get up as a minister and I get up and I declare the word of God and the anointing is upon me to lay hands and, and we see great prophecy and all of those great things, but if I have harbored on the inside jealousy, envy, greed, lust, whatever it is that I've been trying to cover down deep and God's been begging me, shaking me, oh, get rid of this, get rid of this, let me deliver you but I just keep on pushing it to the back there comes a point where Satan comes to get what's his likewise Jesus comes to get what's his so jealousy envy lust all these things sin is painted with a brush and it's marked for destruction. But everything we've made an altar to God for is painted with a brush and it's marked by the blood. So when there is a time of reckoning, of reconciliation, then Satan comes to take what is his, but Christ is coming to take what is his. So Satan comes because there's jealousy, envy, whatever, 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 whatever. But Jesus comes because you've been painting that son of yours. You've been painting that daughter of yours. You've been painting that husband and that wife. So Satan's come to, to take what's his and he comes and he kicks the door in. And he's like, I'm here to get what, I've, what I have rights to. But then you stop and say, oh, I'm sorry you wasted your trip because God's been shaking me and taking me through deliverance. And I am free. I am free. I am free. And by the way, you've been inhabiting the land in my son's mind. But Jesus has come to take back what's his because he's marked by the blood. So now he's ripping my son, my daughter, my husband, my wife out of your grip. You need to see that, that the person, because I believe that we are at the brink of the greatest prodigal uh, 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 fulfillment of prophecy we've ever seen. The prodigal son was under a delusion, complete delusion. But when he was in that pig pen and he was eating that slop, 
the delusion broke and he said, if I could just get back to my father's house. Well, you need to see Jesus reach down and pick this child up and shake the mud and the dirt off of him and pick him up and say, your mama marked you with my blood. Your daddy made an altar for you. And I've come to take what is mine because you've got my blood on you, boy. He told Jacob or Israel in Isaiah 43, he said, you are mine. When something is called by God's name, when he puts it, when it's marked for him, he says, you are mine. So I believe we're in a time of the reconciling of accounts. Satan is coming to take what is his. But God's coming to take what is yours. See, that's so powerful to me. Because so many people are believing for family restoration. And there's been a delusion. There's been a distortion at at least, but a delusion at most. Keep building your altar. Keep painting that problem with the blood of Jesus Christ. Keep sacrificing on that altar because we're in a time of reconciliation. So Satan may be trying to come what's, uh, get what's his and you stop. Ask God to show you what is legally his. What in my life is devoted to destruction? What do I need to get rid of? And then, When the enemy comes, I don't want to be trivial, but he's like the big bag wolf. When Satan comes and he's got rights, we're in trouble. But when we're washed by the blood, saved by the grace... And the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, he's nothing more than the big bad wolf. He's coming, huffing and puffing and threatening to blow something down. But we just stand out. I'm covered by the blood. There's nothing you can do. You have no legal right. See, we've talked about legal right and, and, and things like this, but this is, this is it's the same thing but at a time of reconciliation. Yes, it's legal right, but now is a season that that Satan is trying to get what he feels is his. It is the years and years of the seats and the reconciling of accounts. So let me give you one last point. Our, Our worship team can come. So demonic times. Delusion, great light, the boundaries and borders are being redrawn. Last point, Joel chapter 2. I told you at the beginning I'd get there. The last point is outpouring. I believe we are at the time to see the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit we have ever seen. We've seen revivals. We've seen moves. But not like we're about to see. And if you look through times in Scripture uh, of, of great revival and outpouring, whether it be in the Old Testament with the nation of Israel, the New Testament, it's at the darkest of times. Read through the book of Judges. When they were under persecution by another nation, they would cry out to the Lord. God would hear their cry, send a deliverer. Great revival. 
It was always at the darkest of times that God sent the word to break the darkness and bring forth the greatest revival. So when we look around and we see these are the darkest times, some of the darkest times we've ever seen. I mean, make no doubt, days like September 11th were dark moments, World War II, dark seasons. But when you see the overall uh, darkness, the wickedness that is present in this day and age, it's the darkest times we've ever seen. We are ripe for the greatest of moves. So Joel chapter 2, verse 23. Be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication, and he has poured down for you the abundant rain, the early and the latter rain as before. The threshing floor shall be full of grain, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have, have eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, the cutter, my great army which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am... The Lord your God, and there's no one else. And my people shall never again be put to shame. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit, and I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. Now, there's... Point by point here, first it starts off with, I'm going to bring restoration to everything you've lost. I'm going to send the former and the latter rain at the same time. And then he says, and then I'm going to pour out my spirit like you've never seen before. And then there will be signs in the heavens. Chapter 3, now the judgment comes. So prior to the judgment of God... You have restoration, you have revival, you have signs in the heavens. The sun being turned to darkness, moon being turned to blood. Just a few years ago, we had the blood moons. Tomorrow, we have another eclipse. These are signs in the heavens. Should we all bunker down because there's an eclipse tomorrow? No. Now, if I'm wrong, we need names and addresses for everybody who stocked up food, just in case. Because you're going to have visitors tomorrow afternoon. But he's saying right here, Joel is an end-time prophecy. He says, God's going to move in great restoration. And then you're going to see his spirit poured out. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Then, then, then you'll see the judgment of God. In 2 Thessalonians, it says that there'll be a great falling away, a great rebellion, an apostasy before. We're there. So God's not contradicting himself here. He's saying it will be the best of times and it will be the worst of times. There will be things that are so dark and there will be things that are so bright. There will be a falling away, but there will also be great revival and restoration. The enemy will come to take what's his. Oh, but Christ is coming to take what's his. It is the dualistic nature of the season that it will be the best of times and it will be the worst of times. Great revival great darkness great outpouring you can stand with me this morning these will be times of great lack and they will be times of great abundance 
These will be times of great sickness, and these will be times of great healing. These will be times of great despair and times of great hope. These will be times of destruction. These will be times of construction. There'll be times of darkness, but there'll be times of light. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I thank you. Lord, for the times, for the season that we live in. I thank you, God, these are the best of times. And I thank you, Lord, for your wisdom to know how to handle the worst of times. I thank you, Lord, that your church is truly a Goshen. That the church, the ecclesia, truly is a Goshen in this season. Where those that are hurting will come to be healed. Where those that are hungry will come to be fed. I thank you, Father, that the church, the ecclesia, is the spiritual Goshen in the dark times. And I thank you, Lord. Over this house, over this place this morning, I thank you, Lord, right now, through this church, Lord, that you're just healing, that you're delivering, that you're restoring. Some of you just need the restoration and hope. You feel like you've lost your hope. Some of you have felt the, the feeling just to give up. Right now, I break that darkness over your minds. In the name of Jesus, every delusion, I say be broken right now. May the light, the revelation of Jesus Christ shatter the darkness over your mind. I say right now, Everywhere the enemy has had rights, it's being removed right now in the name of Jesus. I call for mass deliverance over the churches of Jesus Christ all over the world. That everywhere the enemy has had a right, everywhere he's had claim, all right now, even this morning, God, I thank you, idols are being given up all around the world. Some of you fight so much oppression because the enemy tries to come in. He's breathing. He's telling you things. He's trying to gain legal access. Some of you have even wondered, have I, how have I given the enemy a legal right? It's not because he has a right. It's because he's leaning over the fence. He hasn't stepped across the border. He's leaning over the fence, just spewing stuff at you, provoking you. I say right now, you will not fall to the provocation of the enemy. Oh, but there's a shield about you in the name of Jesus there is revelation there is clarity there is understanding Discouragement broken in Jesus' name. Fear, we rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Hopelessness, you are broken in the name of Jesus. You are worthy of it all. Over the last several months, I've heard several times mass deliverances. You are worthy of it all. Literally, crowds of people being set free simultaneously. Everyone just raise your hand this morning. Lord, I thank you right now all in your house. 
in your presence under your anointing. I thank you, Lord, right now. Every shackle broken in the name of Jesus. Everywhere the enemy has had some legal right, it is severed, it is revoked in the name of Jesus. Oh, Lord, we give up every idol. We give up everything that is the enemy's. And we place the blood of Jesus Christ over our minds, over our hearts, over our homes, over our families. Right now, as a corporate body, I say to every husband that is not walking the way that they should, your wife is here. We plead the blood of Jesus alongside her over you. And we say to the enemy, oh, we've covered this man by the blood. You're worthy of it all. To every wayward wife, you are worthy of it we cover you by the blood of Jesus Christ. To every wayward son, to every wayward daughter. Oh, we cover you by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we say, oh, addiction, go back where you came from. Satan can have the addiction, but he can't have the person. Oh, greed, go back where you came from. Satan can have the greed and the lust and the unforgiveness and the anger, but he can't have the person. We plead the blood of Jesus over every son, over every daughter. And we say right now, we stand for our bloodlines. To those with adult children and, the, and your children are married. That spouse joined into your family. So God, we cover the son-in-laws and the daughter-in-laws. Oh, we say right now, oh, we cover them. We plead the blood of Jesus over them. To the daughters-in-law that have tried to beat a deception to their husbands to lure them away. We break that deception in the name of Jesus. To the sons and laws that have tried to be a deception over those daughters, we break that deception. call out one by one but honestly there's so many people in this church in life that are struggling with family divisions so God we cry out this morning Lord for restoration in families oh we break the delusion I call for the darkness to be shattered by the light of Jesus Christ oh we lay claim we lay claim we lay claim God you know the altars that have been built you know the sacrifices that have been made and we call for the borders we call for the boundaries to be realigned I call for the stronghold of addiction broken. The driving force of the demon of addiction broken in the name of Jesus. Oh, I call for that driving force broken in the name of Jesus. Lord, we ask you for the spouse, for the children, the in-laws, the grandchildren. Oh God, pour out your love. 
pour out your love. Oh, embrace these men. Embrace these women. Oh, God, pour out your love, your mercy, your grace. Oh, God, your healing in those deep wounds, those deep places. We call for the restoration to those that are hurting. Oh, God, just fill them. Oh, just fill them. Oh, just fill them. Oh, fill them, oh, God. Oh, those that have been marked in your presence, those that have been marked in your glory. Oh, we call forth. We call forth. Those were seeds. Those were seeds. We call for the seeds and we say, oh, bear your fruit. Bear your fruit. Bear your fruit. You are worthy of it all. From Bear your fruit. Things, to you are all things. You deserve the glory. You are worthy of it all. Is worthy of it all. You are worthy of oh, it worthy all. Of it all. For from you are all things. To you are from you things. are all things. To you are all things. You deserve the glory. Only you deserve the glory. See, that's a sacrifice of worship. Lord, we give sacrifice in this house. Oh, we worship you. For you are worthy of it all. We cry out over our sons. You are worthy. You are worthy of it all. We cry out over our daughters. You are worthy. You are worthy. Over our spouses. Oh God, you are worthy. Oh Jesus. You are worthy of it all. Oh Jesus. From you are all things. Oh Jesus. To you are all things. You deserve. Don't despise small beginning, beginning. Some of you will see small changes. Don't despise small changes. Hold to it, hold to it, hold to it. It's like the wind changing for my season change. Oh, just hold to it. It may just be a small temperature change today. Oh, but hold to it. Oh, we're calling, we're calling, we're calling for the freedom, for the release of the prisoners. If anybody wants prayer this morning, just come come down. We are getting freedom right here. We are getting freedom. We are getting restoration. Oh, I thank you, Lord. Shackles, shackles and chains are being broken.